Hi, it's Mike with UTASC again. I'm here again at GoToConf Chicago 2013. Today I'm sitting down with Ryan Slobodin, who is doing, also doing interviews here, but you're doing, those, doing them as part of the GoTo Conference. Uh, and, and that's very interesting for me. How do, I'm just curious. Well, first, thank you for sitting down, but how, how did you get involved with interviewing, and, and who exactly are you interviewing here at uh, the conference? Sure. So I, I first got involved with the general well, software developer, graduated University of Waterloo Computer Science, 2003. Mm -hmm doing lots of software development. In 2007, I went to a user group meeting in Toronto, and that was being given by Floyd Marinescu, who was the founder of InfoQ. Oh, okay. And so I asked him a couple questions during the talk, and then afterwards he asked, oh, are you interested in writing for this InfoQ news site? Right. It was about a year old at that point. And I thought, oh, that seems interesting. And so I started writing news for InfoQ, and that was, and that's just news about what's going on in the tech space, mm -hmm. so things that developers care about, which one of the nice things about writing for an area where you have an expertise in, like for me as a software developer, I, I code, so I have an idea of what people with my background would like to hear. Right. So I, I try and use that to inform content that I create. I look at it and I say, do I really care about this? Mm -hmm. Yes. Awesome. No? Okay, well then I'm not going to write about it. Mm -hmm. So that, that ends up being a good metric. and. It just it helps things out. So with that, I also started getting involved in InfoQ's conferences, mm -hmm. which are QCons. Right. So starting with QCon San Francisco 2007, and that's where I met the Triforb team. And mm -hmm. Triforb just puts on their partner on QCon, and then they put on GoTo, and they put they help out with the Yao conferences as well. I believe in Australia, just okay. they, they do quite a bit in the conference side. Right. And so was help was helping out with some of the organization and. Some of the editorial content stuff for mm -hmm. conferences after a few years. And also, as far as doing interviews, I just tried to find people that I thought were interesting or right. had good stories. I mean, Dan North is, <laughs> anytime yeah. I talk to Dan, it's a great discussion. I learned a ton. Mm -hmm. And so you, you, I just try and find people like that and have a good discussion with them that have some in front of the video camera. Mm -hmm. And there's an interview. Okay. So that's kind of how I got into it. That's the long chain that led to it. Okay. I noticed, you know, uh, in your style, it seems like you you sit behind the camera and have the the subject in front of the camera. Why did was that a conscious decision to go with that structure, or was that just in, like the natural thing to do? Or? Well, I mean, there's kind of a there's a major minor aspect to it. The minor side is that I'm slightly camera shy. Mm -hmm. um, it's also I tend to take a lot of pictures. Is when you're the one behind the camera, you're not the one that shows up on camera. But th that's more of a minor thing. From my perspective. When I'm doing an interview, I essentially consider myself to be a meat prop, mm -hmm. and I'm not because I'm not the subject of the interview. I'm okay with not being on camera, right? So I can just sit behind and I can make sure that the camera's working correctly because there's oftentimes not a whole team to manage all the equipment. So I watch the camera, I make sure things are going well, and I'm also just asking questions from that perspective. So that's that's just it, it's become my style. Yeah, it's interesting because I was I was comparing and contrasting the style of interview I do with with what you're doing, and uh, you know I, I slightly different perspective, but I certainly feel the pain with managing equipment. What you can't see here is that there was a computer underneath the camera and lights and all kinds of things, and every now and then I have to glance up and be like, oh yeah, it's yeah, it's still going. Um, you know, and 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 some people might notice as me sitting up and getting down at the tail end of the interviews. So I'm sure that that kind of alleviates some of those pressures and allows you to have. But I like to be with the person on the camera so that way it's, it's uh, to me it's like there's three people in the room. There's the camera, which represents you, our audience, and, and, and us having a conversation. Uh, so, uh, you know, but how many interviews have you been doing this a while now, or? Well, I think the last time I did a count, I think I was somewhere north of 70. Okay. Interviews with a variety of people spread out among several years mm -hmm. at different conferences. So, interviews at QCons, go tos at uh, Strange Loop, Spring One, just a, a, a real mix. Uh, actually, also uh, there's some Ruby conferences in Toronto, so I helped out with some of those interviews. Just a, a wide variety. Okay, and uh, you know, is this something that's been is this more of a hobby for you, or are you doing this as part of the conference? It's something that I have great interest in. Mm -hmm. 
So one of the reasons that I got involved in InfoQ to begin with and got involved in the new space was that one, I wanted to be able to learn things. And I find that, well, there's an old saying that when one teaches, two learn. And so I, I found that learning about the news, finding out all this information about the news, and then being able to turn around and synthesize it into a reasonable article to explain it to others, mm -hmm. by having to go through that process, I had to learn about it myself, because right. otherwise I couldn't intelligently learn about it. So that really increased how rapidly I was learning, mm -hmm. because I had to do this for every single article. Right. And then similarly with an interview, of, I'm speaking with arbitrary random people with arbitrary random backgrounds. Mm -hmm. I need to learn a lot about what they're doing because I want to be able to ask intelligent questions about what it is that that's going on. I mean, right. you're going to have different questions for Dan North than you have for Eric Meyer, right. than you have for Jim Weber, than you for than you have for I know Corey. Just a, a very large and diverse set of things. And so, because I'm an information junkie, because I constantly want to learn, mm -hmm. that helps to satiate that part of it. But I also want to share that knowledge with the community. I, I believe strongly that knowledge should be free. And I think that the more knowledge we can get out there and the more communication that happens in our space, because communication can be a real problem at times when developing software. I mean, almost every problem I can think of in software, every issue that comes up that scuppers a project is not a technical issue. It's a people issue. It's some kind of other issue that can often boil down to communication. If, if we can get these ideas out there, we can understand the background behind things, and we can understand why these things are happening, the human stories behind them, we're in a much better place to say whether this technology is applicable to me, whether I could use it for X or for Y. We can see how other people are doing it. Software is a creative process. Right. And so if you hear how others are creating things, and you assume that somebody is reasonable, then if you assume that given their background, given their factors, you would do the same thing, mm -hmm. knowing about their decision process helps you to make better decisions yourself. Right. So it's just general, just trying to get as much knowledge as possible out there because I want to learn as much as possible. And then share it with others. And, and it, it, there's one more thing about the doing it on camera versus uh, one of the philosophies I had with, with you, Tastic, was uh, a lot of people that I'm interviewing write, tweet, blog, you know, they blog, they write books, they come up and they speak, and, but that's a limited audience. But, uh, and, and some do screencasts, I mean, a video, uh, I forget the word, right? Audio cast. But you don't get to see them talk and move and I think there's so much you can learn about a person just through their their actions their, their gestures their but there's also a double edge to that where sometimes when you get people on camera they're not so comfortable um, and, and you have a nice wonderful conversation and then the camera goes on and uh, I have seen that a couple of times do you do you have uh, any uh, any tips or, or techniques that you've used or learned to help people relax on the camera? Sure, so with with the interviews that we do, usually there'll be some kind of post-processing. One of the things I'll do to set the interview at ease is to intentionally flub a couple questions. Like I'll screw something up and be like, ah, oh, yeah. okay, let's, let's do this again. Because yeah. then it's, I, I, you feel a little bit more relaxed because it's not like, oh, you're under the gun, it's high pressure, you gotta do right. it, there's one take and that's it. And it, it allows you to be more relaxed about it. I also try and have, a conversation. I, I want it to be a conversation that we're having, and there happens to be a camera there. Right. And that's actually one of the reasons that, going back to the perspective thing, I'll sit just slightly offset from the camera because then the discussion the discussion is between me and the person. On yeah, the you still have eye contact. But exactly, with the or very very close. And given the resolution of a video box, it, it looks like the person's looking at you mm -hmm. and having that discussion. So that's, I try and have that very, very casual atmosphere because I find that really helps. It doesn't help in all cases. I can think of one or two where the person did completely freeze up and kind of felt the pressure of the situation. Right. But I do find that helps a lot. You just want it to be as relaxing and casual as possible. It's just a discussion. We can edit things afterwards, right. yada, 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 yada. Okay. And, you know, about the learning, you were talking about your learning process when you're writing. Uh, you know, one thing I've, I've gotten from doing these is and you're sitting here, and, and you can probably relate to this. It's you're trying to balance listening, active listening, with preparing the next question, yeah. and then and the next follow up. Because a lot of this is you've you may know a little bit about the person, but you're trying to respond to to their I inquiries. And I go back and I rewatch the video afterwards, and it feels like I'm watching the conversation for the first time, even though I've said that. Is that 
something you've experienced? Yeah, definitely. And one of the things I try and do is, if I have time in advance, and I've got a good set of lists, like say I get a list together a day or two before the conference, which it's nice when it works out, it doesn't always work out that way. Right. I try and have, say, five questions right now. Mm-hmm. And so you have a few things that you can refer back to as part of the discussion. Or, sorry, you have a few things that you can jump to in case the discussion stops at a point and there's not necessarily an immediate pickup. Right. But you can also feel free to pursue a conversation and just ditch the questions that you had planned based on how things develop. So th- there's kind of that a little bit of pre-planning, but also just going with the flow to see where the discussion goes. So, yeah. And would you mind describing a little bit about what your setup is like? What, what is it, what, when somebody is watching one of your videos, what is, what is, what's behind it? So typically there's, well, typically there's just a, a camera and then I'm sitting, are you talking about like physical setup? Yeah, camera? yeah. Okay. I'm not, I mean like the equipment, so like I'm pointing at the camera and the lights yeah. and for here. Yeah. Um, but what is, what is your setup? So a lot of it depends on the venue. Now, that's something where, because you go between different venues, the lighting situation can differ dramatically. So, like, for instance, in this room there, and in the room that we're filming in as well, there's a lot of downlight, and that can sometimes right. cast weird shadows. So what I've done is I've actually, because we don't have any proper spotlights, we just grabbed a couple of the incandescent lamps that they have in right. the room, and we set them up just off camera. So, I mean, right. I, there could be an entire elephant right here, and you couldn't see it because yeah, of the right. magic of photography. Yeah. And so there's a couple of these lights that are set at eye level so that that casts a natural light mm-hmm. on the face. And so usually lighting is kind of the biggest issue you want to sort out. I mean, you want to minimize shadows as much as possible and try and sort all that out. So you work with the lighting that you have and try and get all that and clean up. And then after that, ideally you would have a couple of mics on the speaker, so those you don't necessarily have that. It depends on the situation. In this case, we don't. Right. There's an omnidirectional mic that's on the camera itself. And it's just a camera and a tripod. And then I'll be listening in with headphones, monitoring the conversation to make sure that audio are, levels aren't spiking or dropping. And I can see if there's anything in the background that picks up information. And that's another benefit to being off camera because you can actually monitor it as it's going. And you can see whether there's something which, okay, well, I'm going to have to edit that, so let's restart the question. Mm-hmm. So that, that's the typical setup. It's fairly lightweight, fits and carry on, and yeah. you can take it pretty much anywhere. Yeah, okay. that's, that's, that's what I'll take away. And as far as post processing, are you you're probably on a Mac? I'm assuming you use iMovie or Final I haven't Cut. actually post processed anything myself. Typically, oh, okay. <laughs> typically when I work with uh, like with doing that, there is somebody else who will do the editing afterwards. So the post processing is actually not something that I've done not within the context of this. When I was in high school, I took a lot of video classes and I was involved in the editing there, which was all beta tapes and stuff like this. And that can be a real pain, trying to get things synced up just right to the second or frame. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it can be a pain in the butt. I, I think Mac does tend to be the winner in this space, though. Right. All right, well, thank you very much for taking the time to sit down. Appreciate thank you. it. All right. Thank you.